I uh, spoke with Paul today and he's out of the hospital and he's got to go back and get a stent. Paul Powell. And he has to go in and, and back and get a stent put in. And uh, so I told him, good, now it's time to go have some healthy salad eating material. And he says, just finished at Red Robin with a fried chicken sandwich. I went, oh. <laughs> Pray for his willpower, will you? <laughs> Told him he was a glutton for punishment. He says it's only 600 calories, and I. <laughs> nah. Yeah, he, he, that was his justification. It was only 600 calories. <laughs> Must only add half a sandwich. <laughs> Exodus chapter 13. We, uh, last week we left off in this particular area and we've been talking about our identity in this world. Remember, as he is, so shall we also be in this world. And he is a victorious Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. He, is, he has never lost a battle and he never will. Matter of fact, the scripture says that right now uh, he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and all of his enemies have been made his footstool. So we know that he has complete and total authority over all of his enemies. And because we are in Christ, guess what? All of our enemies should also be our footstool. You just stop and think about what your enemies are. And I'm not talking about people as far as enemies go. Those are not your enemies. I don't care how bad and how immoral they may be or how unjust they may be, they're still not your enemy. Our enemies are principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high place. We need to stay focused at that because our battle is not with those individuals. It's with demonic, with the demonic realm. So we need to understand that not only that they are enemies, but the very product of our enemies become our enemies. And I'm talking about sin, unrighteousness, immorality, uh, sickness, disease, poverty, shame, guilt, all those things become our enemies because Jesus defeated those things on the cross 2,000 years ago. And so we're supposed to be walking in victory over every one of those areas in every portion of our life. Amen? Amen. So as he is, so are we in this world. And so we've been talking about that, about our identity in him and how that we must, uh, we must come back to a place of getting rid of our stinking thinking. We talked about that last week. We need to cast down those imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and bring every thought into the obedience and the captivity of Christ as we enter that arena. And we know that when we do that, we will uh, clothe ourselves with the armor of God. We'll walk in an area of, or the arena of victory. Because remember the battle that we're fighting, we don't start from a from a zero zero score, we start from a score that says we win. We're starting from a platform of victory, not from a platform of defeat. No matter how you feel, no matter what's going on, you're not starting from that platform of defeat because remember, if you're in faith in Christ, you have already overcome the world. The scripture said, this is the faith that overcomes the world, even our faith. So we walk in an atmosphere of faith. We walk in an atmosphere of victory on a continual basis. We are in Christ, therefore we are in a position of victory. So we go from victory to victory, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. So it, it's, it, notice every one of those things, we just improve from where we start. We're not going from defeat, we're going from victory into a greater realm of victory. So this is where we left off last week and uh, started talking about some principles that will help us to understand is when we enter the, the battle. How many of you understand that we were born in a battle? Not that we were just born for battle, but that we were born in a battle, okay? And so as you progress in your walk with Christ is that each time you move into a different battle, that battleground may be just a little bit more difficult than the first battleground you went to. But God is never gonna put us into a position in a battle that we're not ready to, to win, that he hasn't already equipped us to be able to handle. So we're just gonna go back and look at the scripture real quick and then we'll move on to the other principles. But look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. And this is right after the children of Israel come out of, of bondage 
430 years. And God is moving them through and brought them through in deliverance. And there in verse 17, it says, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was very close. For God said, and it, and boy, if I get my tongue ta untangled, per adventure, the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. In other words, God wasn't going to lead them into a battle that they were not prepared to win. Because remember, they just got set free. You just got set free. God's not going to put you in the midst of casting out demons and put you back into the lion's den that way. God's going to lead you into a place where each battle that you are facing, that he knows that you are already equipped to win. You have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You have the word of God. You have Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside, the Spirit of Christ on the inside of you. You are born again child of Almighty God. You belong to the King. But in your walk of faith, remember you move from faith to faith, from glory to glory, right on down the line. There is a level of maturity that you're in. So you may be looking at, wow, that guy over there, look how many demons he's casting out. Or he's laying hands on the sick and people are getting healed and the blind eyes are open. People getting out of wheelchairs. And then you're over here and you're having a hard time praying for somebody with a cold. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want that person with a cold not to be healed just simply means that God is moving you and training you in that area and he's going to move you from place to place to place. And when that happens, man, your faith is going to grow. You're going to be equipped. You're going to move forward. Like with the disciples, they couldn't cast out that, that boy, couldn't cast the demons out of that one boy who was casting the fire and into the water. The, 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 the disciples couldn't do that because they didn't know how to do it at that point. It wasn't that they weren't equipped to do it because they had already seen many of those things happen. So you need to understand is that as you're moving through, don't give up because something didn't happen right here. You need to just keep on pressing in. God is equipping you. He is making, it, making you a person of warfare. He is making you a person of great success in the kingdom of God. You just need to understand. Let God lead you in the direction that he wants you to go rather than you forcing yourself into the midst of something that you're not equipped to handle. Okay? So those are very things that we need to do. One of the safest places that you and I need to be in a place of battle is this, obedience. The safest place for us to be in the midst of a battle is obedience. Because when we are obedient to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us to do, we'll see success. But if we just move on our own mindset to what we feel we should do or what we thought should happen... We'll never find that place of success. You need to pray, ask the Holy Spirit, okay, what am I supposed to do? And then let him lead you. Remember, they that be the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. So let him lead you into the midst of that, okay? So God, number one principle that you'll need to understand, God will never lead you into a battle that you're not already equipped to win, okay? Number two, Psalm 23. There's little mind sense that is very important for you to know when you get in the midst of these things. Okay? Psalm 23. Look at verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Okay? And my cup, it will run over. God is never intimidated by what the, what the devil attempts to do. God is never intimidated by that. Notice what he does. He sets you right down in the presence of your enemy. And what does he do? He prepares a table. You know what a table represents to me besides eating? <laughs> Intimacy. If you look at, remember how many of the old Watch the old TV programs way back when. Leave it to Beaver. Father Knows Best. My Three Sons. Lassie. Remember all those great programs? Okay. Yep. Where were they always sitting at? How about uh, uh, one with Opie? What was that one? Aunt B and Opie and... Andy Mayberry. Andy Mayberry. Thank you very much. 
They would always be sitting around a table and they would always be talking. So it showed the family time of intimacy. So when the father prepares a table before you in the mid, in the presence of your enemies and anoints your head with oil and fills your cup to overflowing, it's a time of intimacy, not with your enemy, but with the father. So one of the things that we need to take and reflect on is in the midst of the battle, are you more focused on the fight than you are on having intimacy with the father? In the, midst of a, in the midst of a battle, what are you focused most on? Are you focused more on the battle or are you focused more on the intimacy with the Father? Think about that just for a moment. If you will think about the intimacy of being with the Father, you'll find peace in the midst of the battle and God, and you will have this time table talk if we can say the anointing comes and your enemy is defeated it's amazing what happens when you spend that intimate time with God and it doesn't have to be that you know a simple I love you Lord is a wonderful intimate word it's a phrase that is just great I love you Lord it's fantastic how long did that take to be intimate with him when you said I love you Instead of, oh my God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> Which one do you think is going to release more faith? I think I love you, Lord. And begin to start worship. See, God has a desire for intimacy in the presence of our enemy. God's not absent when the enemy shows up. God's not absent, okay? <clears throat> our intimacy with God becomes our strength in the middle of that battle. It does. It strengthens you. Don't get so distracted by the warfare that is going on over here, the warfare there, the behind you, what's going on. Uh, because you will get so battle intense that you'll end up losing that fight. Remember the weapons of a warfare are not carnal, but they're what? Mighty how? Through God. Okay? It is the armor of God. Okay? We're clothed with righteousness. We have a garment of praise. There's all this stuff that God clothes us with to enter into those things through intimacy with God rather than becoming so intense with the battle that is going on around you. That will cause you to uh, walk in human strength rather than in the grace of God when you become battle intense. And Paul is a good example of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Remember about the story about the thorn of the flesh? Paul was buffeted by this thorn in the flesh. Maybe you understand what it meant to have the thorn in the flesh. It wasn't a sickness. It wasn't a disease. What it was was a continual attack. Buffeting is, is a Greek term like, that means like the waves of a sea beating against the bow of a ship. Now, how many of you understand the sea doesn't beat you only one time on the bow of the ship? It's a continual battering, isn't it? Because you're always going against it. Well, Paul was shipwrecked. How many times? And how many times was he beaten? How many times was he imprisoned? How many times was he stoned? Even one time he was even stoned to death. I mean, there's so many different things that Paul came against in the battle for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul even at one time became very, very focused on getting rid of that rather than moving forward into the things of God. And he says, I besought the Lord three times and you didn't remove that from me. You can just kind of hear Paul saying that. And, and the Lord said to him, he says, don't worry, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So we need to rest in the grace of God rather than in getting so intense in the battle that we lose sight of the grace and the mercy and the love and the power of God. Follow that? So don't get battle weary in the midst by getting focused on your enemy and getting focused on the fight. Get focused on God. And when you, that's what David did. And I've told this story before and I'll tell it again because it's so good. When David fought Goliath, David wasn't intimidated by the giant because this is what his brothers and the children of Israel did. 
they lined themselves up with the, with the giant and they were intimidated because of the size of the giant. David, on the other hand, lined up the giant next to God and he found out how small the giant was. See, David got God focused, not giant focused. He got God focused and not battle focused. That's why he could say to Saul, hey, I don't trust the armor you wanna give me. For God delivered me out of the hand of the lion and out of the hand of the bear, and he will deliver the, this earth uncircumcised Philistine this day, and I'll take his head from him. You see, because David became God-focused in the middle of the, of the battle. And you noticed everything that along the line at Ziklag, David got uh, focused on God. When David got back from the, from the battle, that the Amalekites had destroyed all of his town, taking his wife, his children, everybody else's wives and children and money and burned the thing to the ground. First thing David did, got God focused. He didn't get battle focused. He got God focused. He said that he inquired of the Lord. He put on the linen ephod. He worshiped God. And then he said, God, what do I do? God said, get up, go get them. Okay. Now, if David never got God focused in the midst of that, all he would have been was battle intense focused and he would have never recovered all. And David did recover all of it. So in the midst of your battle, make sure that you understand, number one, God's not intimidated by the enemy. And number two, take your time of intimacy with God and don't get so battle focused. You'll lose the battle if that happens. You just get intimate with God and you will win. Amen? Okay. How about <clears throat> next thing is uh, I want you to do is refuse fear. Everybody say this with me. I refuse fear. I refuse fear. That is the hardest thing for most people to do. And I'll say it to you again, I've said it before, fear is not an emotion, fear is a spirit, okay? You are not battling emotions when you were fearful, you are battling a spirit. And you need to see what God's word says about that. Remember the scripture says, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. You did not receive a spirit again to fear, which is bondage, it says. Okay? Fear is bondage. So you need to learn how to refuse fear. My favorite scripture concerning fear is Philippians chapter 1 and verse 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversary, which is an evident token of their perdition and your victory. Okay? What does that mean? It simply means this. Is if you refuse fear, it is a signpost to the devil of number one, of his impending doom. That he is going to be locked up in the lake of fire, he is no longer going to be able to intimidate you when you understand that fear cannot have power over you. So in nothing terrified by your adversary. Who's your adversary? The enemy, which is the devil, right? So whatever he throws you away, he's going to lie to you about your body. He's going to lie to you about your finances. He's going to lie to you about your family. He's going to lie to you about your friends. He's going to lie to you about everything about your life. He's going to put a black cloud over your life wherever he can try. And when that fear comes to you, that's the point where you have to make a bold statement. Make it out loud. I don't care what you do, whether you parade around the house, you praise God, you just re you just make a bold declaration by the word of God. You rebuke fear. I mean, whatever it takes, you do that. Do not let it come in and intimidate your life. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is, I'm just going to, instead of doing the King James, I'm going to say it this way, which is evidence to the enemy of your soul of his impending doom and the establishment of you in righteousness. <laughs> you follow that? So you can't allow for that to come in. As soon as you allow for the fear to enter the battleground where you stand, I will guarantee you this, 
it, you will have an uphill battle for a long time until you can finally come to the place where fear no longer has a voice in your head. Okay? You must refuse fear. Proverbs 3.25 says this. It says, be not afraid of sudden fear. Anybody ever have fear all of a sudden <gasps> arrest you like that? I mean, I think everybody on the face of the planet has, right? But he, the scripture says there is a fear of sudden fear. That's a double fear, isn't it? Okay? Be not afraid of that sudden fear when it comes. So when, you, when sudden fear grabs your heart, arrests your mind, whatever it does, freezes you up, immediately enter into another realm, the realm of praise, the realm of worship, the word, whatever comes to you that comes from the Spirit of God, make that your weapon and put it into effect and start using that. Draw the quiver, arrows out of your quiver. Load your gun with bullet, whatever it is that you, whatever phrase you want to use in your warfare, but enter in from the side of God, not from the side of fear. Okay? Don't let that happen. See, when you refuse fear, something happens. Your enemy no longer is confident, and he becomes mindful of his impending doom and of your God-given authority to walk. Does that mean that he'll never try it again? No, because he's dumb enough to lose again. Okay? So we just need to... But we have to be smart enough and mindful enough by the Spirit of God to walk in that kind of God-given authority that God has given to us. Okay? <clears throat> find the promise that God has given to you. If fear grips your heart over health, find what the promise is for your health. If fear grips that your heart... For finances, find God's promises for finances. If fear grips your heart for relationship, find God's promises for that relationship. Whatever fear is gripping you for, get in the Word. Find out what the Word says about that part for you. Find out God's plan for you in that area and just begin to start speaking the Word of God over your life, over that situation. Faith will dispel that fear. It will do it, okay? So as long as you fear, and as long as fear reigns you, in you, you're actually inviting the devil to come steal, kill, and destroy. I'm just being honest. You need to understand the power that is behind fear. I believe that fear is at the root of everything that goes on in the realm where people are not getting their relief and the promises of God uh, released into their life because fear grips them in that area. If you're going to ask questions, you've got to be really loud. <laughs> okay, not a problem. Just wanted everybody, if you got a question, you got to say it really loud so anybody that's listening can get a hold of that, okay? Another, number four. Submission. Everybody say submission. Submission. <laughs> submission is a very, very important part of winning a battle in the spiritual realm. Okay? James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Submit to God. Number one, okay? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You notice that that Holy Spirit has that in that order on purpose? <laughs> A lot of people try it the other way. I've resisted the devil. I've resisted the devil. I've resisted the devil, but he just won't leave me alone. I said, did you try part one? What's part one? Submit to God. No. Try that first. <laughs> it's kind of like put your shoes on, then put your socks on. That doesn't quite work too good. Okay. 
You've got to learn, number one, come into submission to God. When you will learn to submit under his authority, you'll learn to submit to the voice of Holy Spirit. You'll submit to what the Word says. How many of you understand that a lot of people, they may know the Word, but they don't submit to the Word? They're great at quoting the Word, but they don't submit to the Word. What does that simply mean? It simply means you put it to memory, you didn't put it to life. Yeah, exactly right. It went here, but it never got here. The longest distance in the entire world is right here. From head to your heart. It means that you need to learn to do the work. God wants to trust you with the kingdom and his authority of the kingdom in the earth. That's where his brokers, we are his brokers for the kingdom of God in the earth. And God wants to entrust you with that. But until you submit to what he wants you to do, even in just the very small things, it's amazing what God will do with the small things to turn them into a huge thing. So just learn to submit to that, okay? Submission is a key to personal victory in every area of your life, okay? I want you to understand that your main battle in sport, spiritual warfare is not with the devil. This is going to shock some of you. <laughs> your, your main battle in, sport, in spiritual warfare is not against the devil. It's against your flesh. It's against your flesh. It's our unwillingness to submit to God. <coughs> Bless you. Okay? So, a lot of times we need to speak more to our flesh than we need to do to the devil. <laughs> Read the book of James. It's really good and clear about that. Okay? <laughs> In a lot of different places. Okay? A lot of different areas. Where did I go? I forgot where I went. It'd be really nice if I grabbed the right paper, but I didn't. <laughs> That's embarrassing. That's all right. God knows what to do, right? I don't know where it's at. <laughs> she said she would get it for me. All right. So, <laughs> here we are. I apologize. I left uh, the last uh, two things out that we were supposed to have, but that's okay. God knows all about that. But, so let's just review real quick. First thing is what? Number one is that God is not going to lead you into a battle that you are not equipped to win. Number two, intimacy is going to be one of your greatest places in the midst of that battle. As God prepares a table before you in the presence of his enemies. Number three is what? Fear. Refuse fear. And then the last one is what? Submission to God. Can you think of anything in your life, just don't have to say it to me right now, but in any one of those four areas that we talked about that you can use improvement in? We all can, can't we? So wouldn't honesty be a real good key then? <laughs> Even no matter where we're at, how many years we've served God, how, how much of the word that we know that we don't know, wouldn't it be really a key factor is if it, we would focus on those areas and put them into practice? I'm telling you, we're going to enter into some time in the very, 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 very near future where the battle is going to be intense like you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And I don't just say that as something trite to say. I don't just say that as just saying it very, very lightly. And I don't say, say it to sound spiritual because I'm not. 
I'm just telling you is that God is preparing us because there is something coming of the likes of which we have never seen before. It's like we talked about a few Sundays ago about a storm that is brewing, that is greater intensity of the likes we've never seen. And you can see it every day. You can see another piece of that coming in to play. And whether there's just a handful of us or whether there's a building full of us, it doesn't matter if there's only one of you that has to face that battle. Let's go back to David just for a moment. How many in the midst of the battle against the giant that came against the children of Israel and the Philistine army that was behind the giant, how many of those individuals were equipped to whip that giant? How many of the children of Israel were equipped? One of them. A small, ruddy, haired, freckled faced little boy with a slingshot. You think about that just for a moment. So it doesn't matter if the person next to you is prepared or not. You be prepared. Amen. That's the moral of that story. Mm -hmm. You need to have your heart right and get that there you're right. So in the next five or ten minutes, let's use that time and just ask Holy Spirit to show you what aspect of your life in those areas that you need to get tuned up. I think that's a good idea. Because nothing like having it fresh on your heart and your mind at this point to do that with. So let's just take the next five, ten minutes and ask Holy Spirit about you. Don't ask him about me. Don't ask him about your spouse or anybody else. You focus on what Holy Spirit says to you and there walk in obedience to whatever he asks you to do. Okay?